Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our service here this evening at uh, the Tron. It's good to see you, and I hope that you'll be able to stay behind a little after the service, and we'll be able to greet you in the Lord's name. This evening is a special evening for us here in the church. It's an ordination service. We're going to be ordaining Rupert Hunt Taylor to be an associate minister in the congregation here. Rupert is well known to our church. He's been a minister in training for a very long time, and he's finally come to the end of that. And this evening, he is to be set aside for ministry by the church. And so we're delighted that uh, we have a number of guests and visitors with us, a number of visiting ministers who are going to be taking part in the uh, ordination service with us. And we welcome you very warmly in the Lord's name. But we begin by singing, and you'll find the words in these blue hymn books, number 628. Number 628, a great hymn of praise, Tell Out My Soul. The Greatness of the Lord. Number 628. As we sit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. 
In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who are we that we should be able to come before you and offer you praise for all things, all that we have are given us by you. We are indeed but strangers, sojourners on this earth, and yet you, O oh God, have covenanted to be our God. You have promised us a future of glory in your grace. And you have called us to follow you in the way everlasting. And so, Lord, as we gather tonight as a congregation of your people, those who name the name of Jesus Christ as Lord, we bow gladly. And we offer you the praise and the love of our hearts. And we ask that all that we do this night, all that we say, all that we think, would indeed be pleasing in your sight and will bring glory to the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, O oh God, who has prepared for them that love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, once again, let me welcome you very warmly to our fellowship this evening. If you're visiting with us, and especially if it's your first time here in the Tron Church, then you are very particularly welcome. And as I said, I hope you don't have to rush away afterwards. We'd love a chance to meet you and greet you. There'll be a uh, tea and coffee and cold drinks served downstairs after the service, and uh, we'd love for you to stay behind and, uh, and share fellowship together. There are uh, notice sheets here. Some of us will have got them this morning. If not, perhaps you receive one on the way in this evening. I'm not going to go through them, but just to remind you of two things. One, please do be praying for uh, our work here this coming week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going to have a group of pastors here, mainly younger men, and uh, we're going to be learning together how better to be uh, teachers of God's Word and how to encourage one another in the faith. So do pray for the Servants of the Word Conference, all of those speaking and all of those taking part. And I know that many of you will be here helping, and for that we're very grateful indeed. But then also to remind you that as part of that conference, there's an opportunity for all of you to come along and uh, be a, a part of it and to share in it uh, on Wednesday evening when, as we said this morning, there's a meeting to be held under the auspices of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership, that newly formed uh, Gospel Partnership here. And uh, Richard Pratt, who is our preacher this evening, as he was this morning, is going to be the speaker on Wednesday, and he's going to be speaking about uh, leadership for this third millennium of the church. So please do come along, bring your friends, and it promises to be a very encouraging and indeed uh, an inspiring evening. Well, our musicians are going to play briefly now while we uh, take up our offering, following which we're going to sing, and then Richard is going to come and uh, preach to us. So as we do that in the quiet, our offerings will be received.
We're going to sing again, and uh, we were studying the words of the Lord's Prayer this morning. We're going to sing our version of it together now, the hymn on the screens. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near and hear your children. Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you came out to this. If you don't normally come out on Sunday evening to church, hooray, 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 because this is a very special evening, and I'm just thrilled to death to be a part of this. I don't know what to say. I've known Rupert for a while now, a few years, and I'm just delighted, and you should be delighted too. This is a new day, a new day for this church, a new day for Scotland. You can say amen. All right, good. That's great. If you have a Bible, it's Sunday evening. You can say amen. If you have a Bible, you'll want to turn with me to the book of 1 Chronicles. This is on page 356 in your Bibles here in the church. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And this is a portion of the Bible that many of you have probably heard before, but we will see how Holy Spirit may lead us tonight to look into it together. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the word of our God. And David, the king, said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, 
the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for settings, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the Lord my God, I give it to the house of my God, 3,000 talents of gold, of go the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver, who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? May God add his rich blessing to the reading of his words. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we bow before you now, because we call no one our teacher but you. We trust no one like we trust you. We hope in no one like we hope in you. We long to see no one like we long to see you. But here we are on this earth, left to do your bidding as your servants. And we're praying now that by Holy Spirit, you will now open our eyes, and touch our hearts, warm us to this truth, and empower us that we may serve you more joyfully and more fully. And as you do that, we will give you the praise. We will give you the honor for it. Amen. It was nearly 40 years ago when I had a meeting like this, where I was called officially into the ministry of the gospel and ordained by in a situation much like we have here, from people from a variety of places doing a variety of things. And after 40 years of doing this, I suppose I have the right to say something about it what it means for you as the lay people of this church, what it means for Rupert, the candidate this evening, for us fellow ministers over here on this side. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> <laughs> they look awesome to me. I suppose after 40 years, I might have learned something that might be of good. Well, as I search my heart and search my own life, what I always come back to is thing that I used to teach students when I was a teacher of theological students, and here it is. When you make your living from your faith, when you make your living from your faith, you always run the risk of losing one or the other. That's a happy tone, isn't it? <laughs> you know, when you become a professional Christian, it's an awesome thing but at the same time, a terrifying thing. Because if you have been in the body of Christ in this world for more than just a few years, you have seen people who are leaders of the church, who are professional Christians, who make their living from their faith, and who end up, because of failures of different sorts, actually losing their faith. You find others who tend to hold on to their faith, but then because their convictions are such that the church is not willing to have it and it leads to difficulties, um, they lose their living. So it goes for leaders of the church, which is why all of us here this evening, as this holy moment is about to occur, should be prayerful for the young man who is about to step into the arena of becoming a professional religious worker, someone who makes his living from his faith, who from this point forward will be someone who's always in danger of losing one or the other. We live in a day when there could be no greater need for leaders of the church. In fact, if you watch television at all, if you watch the news, you could honestly say, I think, that there is no greater day than we need leaders of the world. Things are a mess, aren't they? And I've watched enough of your television to know that when people run for, to become MPs, I know what it's like. Who is elected as an MP? Someone who's popular. Someone who is celebrated. Someone who's a celebrity. Not necessarily the people who are gifted and even called to be leaders. 
because being a celebrity and being a leader are two very different things, and it's so much so for the body of Christ as well. We stand in a day when what we need, what you need in Scotland, is men who will stand and lead the church of Jesus in difficult times, in difficult ways, for the glory of Christ. But the natural tendency for all of us is to say, well, what we want is someone who will be popular, someone who will be fancy, somebody who we can celebrate. And tonight we're going to celebrate one young man, but I want to tell you this, if God is merciful, he will never become a celebrity, but he will be a leader of the body of Christ, something quite different. We just read a passage in the Bible where there was a man who was both a celebrity and a leader. He had to learn how to lead, unfortunately, the hard way. And he was a man who struggled with this reality of when you make your living from your faith, you tend to lose one or the other. His name was King David. And if there's anything that anyone knows about King David... If we were to walk out on the street tonight and ask someone, have you heard of King David in the Bible? Yes, of course. You know what would come to mind immediately. Bathsheba. His great failure. Many people, even followers of Christ, don't even know the great things David accomplished. All that we remember about him is Bathsheba, the great failure in David's life and the trouble that came on his house for generations after generations because of this man who was called to lead the people of God. And so naturally, as Christian people, when we read characters in the Bible or we look around ourselves at other people, our hearts and our minds yearn to see someone who will be a perfect leader. And you know what's so wonderful about it is we have one. He's only one, though, and his name is Jesus. Jesus, our Savior, was perfect from beginning to end, perfect in every way, as the leader of God's people. But, you know, Rupert isn't Jesus. So, Rupert, you can't be just like Jesus. So is there any hope for this man? Is there any hope for you being led by men like this, who are frail, who are weak, who will have failings over and over and over again, and who probably in the end of things you could count more failures than more successes. Is there any way for people like that to be counted as successful, God-honoring leaders of the body of Christ? The answer is yes, and we find it right here in 1 Chronicles 29. Because in this part of the Bible, we don't learn about Bathsheba. What we learn is David's life goes from greater to greater to greater to greater despite his failures. And this chapter we just read is actually the grand finale of David's whole reign. He's now coming to the time of the end of his life when he's about to hand things to his son Solomon. And this is not a sad day. Is not one where people look back with regret and say, oh, he had such potential, he could have done so much more if he just hadn't failed. That's not what happens here. What happens here is the great celebration of what God did in this man's life. Yes, this David. This David who failed because he was so frail. Sometimes I think that when we think of Jesus as our exemplar, Jesus as our great leader, It's it's a wonderful thing to try to attain to who he was, but at the same time very difficult and very discouraging because we never make it. We never make it. Body of Christ, please remember, this young man is never going to make that goal. But let me tell you something. Rupert, other pastors here in this church, these other pastors, even people like me, we can be like David. We can mess it up very badly, but in the end, by God's mercy... We can count it as good. And more good can come rather than bad. And wonderful things can be done for the kingdom of God by weak, frail people in ministry. This passage is one of those rare times when you are able to actually look into the heart of a man like David. When you're able to see his motivations, his abilities, his skills as a leader of the people of God. And what I'd like for us to do is to see how this chapter, just step by step, walks us deeper and deeper and deeper into the heart 
of a man who is a sinner, a man who is weak, but a man who succeeded, succeeded as a leader of God's people. And the very first thing that we can see from the passage we just read, beginning in verse 2, shall we? I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx, and so on and so on. If there's one thing that you can derive from this verse number two here, it is this. David was a practical leader. He knew how to set goals. He knew how to get the goals done. He was a great practical leader. We need certain amounts of bronze for the temple of God. We need certain amounts of wood. We need certain amounts of gold. I can gather all that. I can light it up. I can set it up. Now, tonight, we have a young man before us, and he would not even be before us. He would not even have made it this far if you were not convinced he was this kind of leader. This is the easy part, Rupert. Able to make a plan and complete it, able to write a sermon and deliver it, able to meet people, make them feel welcome, a man who's able to do the practicalities of everyday life. This is what leaders of the church look for when they go around looking for people to become leaders in the future. And you have that, but that's just the beginning, the superficial of what it means to be a leader. A celebrity, that might be all that he has, but a leader of the people of God will go much further. And so does this passage. As we take a look in verse 3. Moreover, in addition to all I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own gold and silver because of my devotion to the house of my God. I give it to the house of my God. Prior to this, in verse 2, David's actually talking about the royal treasuries, the the money of the state. And he's saying, I arranged it all, I counted it all, I managed it all, I'm a practical leader, no problem. But here, he's saying, now look, what I did was, I reached very deep down into my own pockets, my own personal wealth, my own personal abilities, my own personal life, and I'm delivering that over to this great goal of building the temple of God. That's why we find in the New Testament teaching very plainly that elders are not to lead by coercion or by compulsion their people, but lead by their example. The life of a person who is exemplary is a hard life because a leader has to walk a tightrope that's very difficult to walk as an example. And here's the tightrope. You ready for it? (sighs) He has to be an example, but an example has to be seen. Rupert's private life is disappearing tonight. How about that? As of tonight, his life is an open book. Sorry, yours is too. But she's a Virginian, so it's no problem. (laughs) She was born for this. An open book. Now, you know the dangers of that when your life becomes an open book. For people to see, people to watch. We call it the fishbowl in the United States. The pastor's fishbowl. It's not something he has on the counter. It's something that he is. You're looking at his life all the time. And he will be judged by standards that you will never be judged by. You'll hold him to be almost perfect to compare to anyone else, including yourself. And when that is the reality, that a minister of the gospel loses his private life, he can no longer say, I'm a public figure, but now I'm in my private life. Don't try to get me to connect these two. This is what politicians do all the time, isn't it? I can be a good politician and have a terrible private life. Well, maybe you can, but I'll tell you this. You cannot be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, have a great public life and a weak inner personal life. It just cannot happen. And the weak personal life is that which is now on display to the whole world. And they will look, and they will look, and they will look, and the temptation that will be faced by every minister of the gospel whose lives are being constantly scrutinized is the temptation of hypocrisy. 
to pretend to be something you aren't, to pretend to be better than you really are. This is why Jesus warns the Pharisees in his day, who were, in fact, leaders of the people of God at that time. Jesus acknowledged that, that their lives were just full of hypocrisy because they lived their lives for the sake of others to watch. Oh, it's true, others will be watching, but now Rupert must never live his life for you to watch. Because here's a man who, above all, must, from the heart, be one who's related to Jesus, and wants Jesus to examine his life, even sometimes to his public detriment. So yes, here we find the writer of Chronicles moving from the practicalities to this lovely image of what it means to be a leader. He's an example for all to follow. Now those of you who are as old as me or older, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking exactly what I'm thinking. Uh, What kind of example can this young man be? What has he experienced that could make him exemplary for the rest of us? Well, begin to look, begin to watch, begin to pray, because Holy Spirit can bring a wisdom, can bring a maturity, can bring a holiness to this young man's life. Only Holy Spirit can do that, that can actually astound you, astonish you at the idea that even someone a few years can become an exemplary leader for old people like me. Wouldn't that be a great joy? But that's why he needs your prayers. Okay, so the chronicler goes from the superficial of practicalities to a little bit deeper, thinking in terms of, well, he's an example. But now, one step deeper into the heart of David, a man who failed, but in the end succeeded. How did he do it? What was true of him? Take a look now at verse 10. David actually succeeds in calling others to give their contributions to the temple, not by ordering them, but by showing example to them. But this is what happens then in verse 10 when he has such success. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in in the heavens and on the earth is yours yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted above all. Both riches and honors come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Another step deeper into the heart of David is simply this. He was not about to take credit for what he had done. Do you know that several times in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he talks about things that he had done. I did this, I did that. But then he qualifies it with a little comma or a little parenthesis. Yet not I. Yet not I. Because he did not want people to have the false impression that he thought that he as great as he was, as accomplished as he was, as a missionary of Jesus, was actually the one doing it. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in Rupert, the one who will be leading this church. The power of Holy Spirit in the Christian leader is the one who is able to succeed the kind of man that David was here. And so David was quick, even in public, not in private because, oh, if he did that, then we'd all understand, but even in public to say, no, 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 not me. How was David able to do that? It's because David knew David. Every minister of the gospel who's here tonight knows themselves. And as the years go by, it becomes increasingly evident to all of us, doesn't it, brothers, that it is not we who are doing this. Whatever successes we have in this world are purely and simply the grace and the mercy of God in us. And this is the attitude that you must require. You must require it of your leaders. Now, when I was a young pastor, 
And I began preaching week after week after week. As soon as I got in the car with my wife, do you know the first thing that came to my lips? It wasn't, isn't God good today? Boy, I sure am glad God did something really great today. I think maybe the Holy Spirit was actually at work in the service today. That's not what I said to my wife. If she were here, I would ask her right now, Gina, what did I say? Because she could tell you. This is what I would say to her. How did I do? How did I do? Was it good? Of course, the problem was she would always tell me the truth. <laughs> then we'd have the biggest argument of the whole week as to why my sermon was no good. Every week it happened that way. Until finally my wife said, Richard, you just have to stop asking that question of me because I'm going to tell you the truth about it. Because this is not about you. And I am not going to allow you to look at yourself and say, didn't I do a good job today? If we're going to be in this game called being a Christian leader, it's not going to be about you, Richard. That was a hard lesson to learn from my wife when I was 23 years old. But there's the reality. Now let me encourage you this way. I know you. I know Scott's enough to know this is the way you are. Just like with money, you are like this with compliments. <laughs> Am I telling the truth now? Oh, a little bit too close to home here. Because you don't want someone like Willie or someone like Rupert to get a big head, do you? You don't want them to explode with all this wonderful compliments you may lay on him. But let me just tell you this. They need the encouragement of you telling them this was great. This really helped me. I was so encouraged. They need you to tell them that. But then you watch and expect a man like Rupert to say, I thank God for that. I sure am glad that the Holy Spirit was working today. I'm sure I'm glad that Christ did that for you today. Because it wasn't me. You won't believe it, but pastors need the encouragement of their people to say thank you for serving Christ in this way. But then they need to reciprocate by saying thanks be to God because everything I gave you today came to me from him. It is not my doing, but Christ in me. A step deeper into the leader. From the practicalities to being an example, to knowing where the power comes from, to knowing where the gifts come from, to knowing where the successes come from, and not hesitating for a moment in public, as David did here, to thank God for the successes of the ministry. One more step into the heart, now deep into the heart, of someone who knows what it means to be a Christian leader, beginning in verse 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and from your hand we and from your own hand we we've and from your own hand we've given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is nothing abiding. O oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for the building of the house for your holy name comes from your hand and all is your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, our fathers, Keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all that he may build a palace for which I have made provision. What do we see here? We see that in humility, David understands something that no minister wants to admit. Everything we do, everything we accomplish can all go away tomorrow.
I hope you know that that's true in your own life. Sometimes, you know, things move along well, and you feel like, well, nothing's ever going to change. It's only going to be good upon good upon good. But in a moment, in a moment, it can all go away. And David knew that this was the case. Oh, they were having a great day of celebration at this time in preparation for Solomon. But he knew that the people needed to have this attitude in their hearts forever. Oh, they were having a great day. David was having a wonderful day, praising God for what he had done, but he knew it could all go away in the days of Solomon. So what does he do? He turns to the Lord his God and he pleads with him, please give this to your people forever. Please strengthen Solomon that he may obey you because I know that everything I have done can go away tomorrow. Rupert? You're going to do magnificent things by the power of God's Spirit. You are. But you don't want to do them just for your day. The reality is you want something that will be for you, yes, your family, yes, your children, yes, your grandchildren, yes, your great-grandchildren, on and on it goes for generations to come. That's what we need from leaders. But you know what they must be if they're going to be those kinds of leaders. They must be people who constantly turn to the Lord Jesus and ask for His blessing on what they have done. Constant dependence, every day, every moment. Leaning on him. And I hate to tell you this, but usually the first thing that leaves a minister's life, Rupert, when he becomes ordained, is prayer. Too busy to pray. Too busy to ask. Too busy to make sure things are secured by Christ. But this is where he needs you. Because he needs you as the people of God to hold him up before God. So that he will be a man of prayer. Do you remember I told you at the very beginning? That when you make your living from your faith, you're always in danger of losing one or the other. How can we avoid that? by this wondrous passage where a man like David who failed so miserably can come off in the end as a successful, faithful servant of God. Practical, yes. Exemplary, yes. A man who gives praise to God for all that happens and a man who knows how utterly dependent he is on Jesus for the ministry that he serves. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, how we are delighted in you because there's no one who had a plan like yours. There's no one who is more perfectly exemplary than you. There's no one who offered praise and honor to the Father like you did. There's no one, there's no one who depended moment by moment on the grace of the Father in his life. So we come to you now and pray for your blessing on this congregation and on Rupert and his family that by your Holy Spirit, By your Holy Spirit, a new day will come in his life and in the life of this church because of what you're doing tonight. And as you do it, we will praise you for it. Amen. We're going to sing together number 632. We have a gospel to proclaim, good news for all throughout the earth, the gospel of a Savior's name. We sing His glory and tell His worth. Number 632.
Please be seated. Now some words of introduction. We are a church in the Presbyterian tradition. That means that although we, of course, believe that the focus of ordinary church life is within the local congregation, nevertheless, each congregation, at least each true gospel congregation, is not independent, but is rather interdependent, along with all other gospel churches, and mutually accountable to the rule of Christ himself. That's the pattern that we see in the New Testament, when in cities like in Jerusalem or Ephesus or Corinth, the church no doubt consisted of many house churches, but their leaders could nevertheless be gathered in one place and addressed together as the oversight of the church in that place, in Corinth or Ephesus or wherever, united in interdependence under the apostolic teaching. Now, this interdependence and this mutual accountability was especially important in the issue of recognizing and accepting genuine teaching ministry. Because, of course, that ministry had to be consistent and true and trusted among all the churches where teachers might travel to teach. And so we see in Acts chapter 16, for example, that when Paul chose Timothy as his co-worker, we're told that Timothy had the approval and the support of the brothers in Lystra and Iconium. That is a plurality of churches and leaders. And in 1 Timothy 4, Paul tells us that it was a body of presbyters, no doubt the leaders of these various churches who, along with Paul, laid hands on Timothy to ordain him, to publicly recognize him, and indeed to enable him thereby for his ministry throughout these many churches. And this is all bound up with the matter of authority and accountability. To be ordained like that by a group of leaders is to be accountable to them, because these men are responsible for conferring that pastoral office and task upon you. That's why Paul is able later to write to exhort Timothy in the pastoral epistles to encourage him in his calling, appealing back to that ordination. And he does so because ordination in that way creates that relationship of accountability. And of course, tied to that accountability is also authority. As the centurion remarked to Jesus, it is those recognized to be under authority who also can carry authority and who can exercise authority among others. So Timothy is told he is to teach the truth rebuking and reproving and exhorting, whether what he says is popular or not. And he can only do that because his authority is recognized to come from beyond simply the congregation where he's ministering at that time, where perhaps many people do not want to hear what he is saying. If his authority was conferred only from within that congregation, if the pulpit was therefore effectively controlled entirely by the pew, then if the pulpit teaches what is unpopular and unwanted, that authority can simply be removed, and indeed that pastor can simply be removed. And sadly, that is often the story in some churches where there is only entirely independent and congregational authority where there's no recognition of any interdependence and mutual accountability among those in the wider church, among those who claim the truly apostolic succession of being preachers of the gospel of truth. But no, churches must know that their teachers have authority, and therefore that they are to heed that teaching and submit to that teaching when perhaps sometimes they do not want to. But part of the trust involved in that is that they also know that their teachers are held accountable to a body of trusted others who keep them and indeed who keep one another to the biblical truth and to the genuine apostolic faith. They need to know also that if he is in error in either life or doctrine, others will hold him to account. 
And they also need to know that as he walks in godliness and truth and faithful ministry, he will also have the support and the force of others behind him, as he may have to teach unpalatable truth, as he may have to tackle error in the life and doctrine of the church among them, both for their own good and for the wider good of the church of Jesus Christ in every place. And that, in essence, is the great value that such wider extra-congregational accountability brings to the church. Now, in the past, as we know, such presbyterial oversight for us was made up when we were bound structurally as part of the Church of Scotland. But of course, as that situation made abundantly clear, it is possible to be bound up structurally with those whom you might agree with on a few issues of church government and the like, but might differ with greatly on almost every matter of importance as far as the truth of the gospel is concerned. However, real unity and therefore effective accountability comes not from structural unity, but from unity in the truth of the apostolic gospel. And as the statement of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership puts it, gospel unity can only be effective and meaningful where there is clear agreement on core truths, such as the person and work of Jesus Christ, the grace of God and salvation, and the inerrancy of the Scriptures. And so as part of the newly formed West of Scotland Gospel Partnership, we have bound ourselves with others locally in such gospel unity. Our churches and as leaders... Well, we may differ on a few incidentals, namely concerning quantities of water, to be quite frank. <laughs> but we are united in fundamentals, and we are committed to keeping one another to the historic biblical apostolic faith, indeed the Reformation faith of our forefathers here in Scotland. And further, as a congregation here at the Tron, we have publicly bound ourselves to a body of presbyters in Scotland and beyond, our council of reference to whom we and to whom I personally, as a senior minister here, look for counsel and for accountability. And the truth is, there is nothing in the New Testament to limit biblical presbyterial accountability to a small geographical locality or even to a single nation. Indeed, the reverse is the case. The New Testament churches were utterly international in their relationships. And so it is that we today, with the benefits that modern communication and travel can give us, we are able to be part of a truly worldwide presbytery, a truly gospel worldwide fellowship with those with whom we are at one in the gospel truth and with whom we share bonds that are real and accountability that is therefore realistic as we keep one another to the faith of our fathers in gospel work. And so that is why this ordination service this evening is not just a congregational matter, but a presbyterial one. We have a presbytery here. We have a body of presbyters, of pastor teachers of the church who know us and who know Rupert and who are at one with us in the gospel. And together, they will act to ordain our brother Rupert to the ministry of Christ Church, a ministry that they all recognize and they all therefore will have a part in. And so we have brothers from the West of Scotland uh, Gospel Partnership. Craig Dyer is with us from Harper Church and John Mowat is with us from Greenview Church. We have some representatives of our own church's uh, council of reference. We have Dick Lucas and Peter Dixon and we have Martin Allen. And uh, we also have Richard, who has been preaching to us from the uh, Florida Presbytery of the Presbyterian Church in the USA, and also from uh, New York Presbytery, uh, Tom Oates, who's with us for the conference next week. And of course, we also have our senior associate pastors from our own church here. And also, I might tell you, we have greetings, some of which you'll hear a little later from various others who, in their absence, are nevertheless associating themselves with the ordination taking place this evening. And so I'm going to invite all of our visiting presbyters here to come forward. And Rupert, would you come forward here and stand on the step up here? Rupert, it is 
a great personal joy for me, as I'm sure it is for our whole congregation this evening, for you to come before us and to be ordained. I will never forget when you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ here some eight years ago at a time of great personal struggle and darkness for me, for which I thank God. I had the joy of marrying you to this wonderful lady who is at your side. I've baptized your two little ones, and I hope we'll do the next 15 as well. <laughs> that bit wasn't in the script. <laughs> but I have watched you and worked with you over these last five years as you've trained with us, first as an apprentice in ministry, then as an assistant on our staff. I have rejoiced with others in seeing the development of your gifts, and now I gladly sit under your ministry of teaching and learn many things from you, for which I thank God. And so it's a great joy that I have this privilege of overseeing your ordination this evening. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sole King and Head of the Church, who being ascended on high has given gifts for the edifying of the body of Christ, we're met as a body of pastor-teachers to ordain Rupert Hunt Taylor to the office of the Holy Ministry by prayer and the laying on of hands by presbyters to whom it belongs, and to confirm him in his appointment as associate minister in this congregation, the Tron Church, and also to rejoice in due time that he will become a part-time tutor at our Cornhill training course. And in this act, this congregation, as part of the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, worshipping one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, affirms anew its belief in the gospel of the sovereign grace and love of God, wherein through Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, incarnate, crucified, and risen, he freely offers to all people upon repentance and faith the forgiveness of sins, renewal by the Holy Spirit, and eternal life, and calls them to labor in the fellowship of faith for the advancement of the kingdom of God throughout the world. The Tron Church acknowledges the Word of God written in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the supreme rule of faith and life, and avows the fundamental doctrines of the Catholic faith founded thereupon. It holds as its subordinate standard the Westminster Confession of Faith, containing the sum and substance of the faith of the Reformed Church, recognizing liberty of opinion on such points of doctrine as do not enter into the substance of the faith. And for the avoidance of doubt, the substance of our faith includes at least everything expressed in the evangelical statement of belief of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership, of which we are a founding church member. And so, Rupert, I put these vows to you. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess in you the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you believe the Word of God, that is, the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, to be the supreme rule of faith and life? I do. Are you persuaded that the Holy Scriptures contain all doctrine required as necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And are you determined, out of the said Scriptures, to instruct the people committed to your charge and to teach nothing as necessary to eternal salvation, but that which you shall be persuaded may be concluded and proved by the Scripture? I am so persuaded and have so determined by God's grace. Will you be ready? with all faithful diligence, to banish and drive away from the church all erroneous and strange doctrines contrary to God's word, and to use both public and private monitions and exhortations to the sick as to the whole, as need shall require, and occasion shall be given. I will, the Lord being my helper. Will you be diligent in prayer and in the reading of the Holy Scriptures? And in such studies as help to the knowledge of the same, laying aside the study of the world and the flesh. I will endeavour so to do, the Lord being my helper. Will you be diligent to frame and fashion your own self and your family according to the doctrine of Christ, and to make both yourself and them, as much as in you lies, wholesome examples and patterns to the flock of Christ? 
Do you believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the confession of faith of this church? And do you acknowledge the government of this church to be agreeable to the word of God? I do. Do you promise to be subject in the Lord to those to whom is committed the charge and government over you, following with glad mind and will their godly admonitions and submitting yourself to their godly judgments? I will do so, the Lord being my helper. Do you promise to seek the peace and unity of this church? to uphold its doctrine, worship, and government, and so cherish a spirit of love to all your brothers and sisters in Christ. Are not zeal for the glory of God, love to the Lord Jesus Christ, and a desire for the salvation of men, so far as you know your own heart, your great motives and chief inducements to enter into the office of the Holy Ministry? Do you engage in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ to live a godly, circumspect life and faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully to discharge the duties of your ministry, seeking in all things the advancement of the kingdom of God? Almighty God, who has given you this will to do all these things, grant also unto you strength and power to perform the same that he may accomplish his work which has begun in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You're now required to sign the appointed formula as a seal of the vows that you're made. While Rupert is signing, I'll read what the formula states. I, Rupert Hunt Taylor, believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the statement of belief of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership. I declare that I believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the supreme rule of faith and life, and I accept the system of doctrine of the Westminster Confession of Faith as the subordinate standard of this church, and will uphold these teachings and proclaim them to the church and the world. I acknowledge the government of this church to be agreeable to the word of God, and I promise to observe the order of worship and the administration of all public ordinances as the same or are may be allowed in this church. Will the congregation stand? Let us pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you call us in your mercy. You sustain us by your power. Through every generation, your wisdom supplies our need. You sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the apostle and high priest of our faith and shepherd of our souls. By his death and resurrection, he has overcome death and having ascended into heaven, has poured out his spirit, making some apostles, some prophets and evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip all for the work of ministry and to build up his body, the church. And so we pray you now to pour out your Holy Spirit upon this your servant, Rupert, whom we now in your name and in obedience to your will by the laying on of hands ordain and appoint to the office of the Holy Ministry within one holy Catholic and apostolic church, committing to him authority to minister your word and sacraments and to share in the government of your church. Give him joy in serving you. Give him patience in affliction and keep him faithful in that he may be kept strong in your service until with all your servants you bring him to share in your eternal joy. Through Christ, who died for us, rose again, and lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, Rupert, I declare you to be ordained to the office of the Holy Ministry, in token of which... We give you the right hand of fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
Please, everyone, be seated. I said that uh, we had some other greetings from those who were not able to be with us, and Tom McGill is going to come and just uh, read some of those to us now. We have, had many, we have had many messages of support and goodwill, including from those of our Council of Reference who are unable to be with us this evening, including Tim Keller, the Minister of the Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, and Alistair Begg, the Minister of Parkside Church in Ohio. But I'd like to read to you two greetings in particular. The first is from the Anglican Mission in England, a new grouping of Anglican churches out with the Church of England who have sent us a warm letter from the Reverend Justin Moat, the Chairman, and the Reverend Andy Lyons, the General Secretary, who is also the Director of Crosslinks, and a colleague of Alan Purser, who was with us a few weeks ago. We are thrilled on behalf of the Anglican Mission in England to express our support and solidarity with you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, on the occasion of Rupert's ordination. We in the Church of England are experiencing many of the same pressures that you're facing in Scotland and are very conscious of the importance of contending together for the same gospel once delivered. Please be assured of our love and prayers and of our desire to partner with you in the great cause of proclaiming salvation in Christ to the ends of the earth, not least in Scotland and England, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The second greeting is from Archbishop Peter Jensen, Secretary of the Global Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans and former Archbishop of Sydney and one of our Council of Reference. The Apostle describes himself and his associates as competent to be ministers of the New Covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. This describes the glorious but onerous ministry of the Word. Rupert, you are to be appointed as one who will fulfill this ministry. I pray that you will do so, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. The leadership and the people of your church have made a sacrificial stand on the authority of the scriptures through which Christ, the head of the church, rules his flock. But this I thank God with all my heart. And, dear brother, I thank God for you as you continue to stand faithfully with them on the same great principle. May the Lord bless you and all who are with you this day and always. Thank you, Tom. Well, we're going to sing before Dick Lucas comes and brings a charge to uh, Rupert and to us. Number 597, preachers of the God of grace, heralds of the dawning day, fit them, Lord, for all they face, prove their calling, guide their way. Number 597.
previously said. Well, Rupert, it's a delight for me uh, to give you a charge tonight. We've been brothers and friends for quite a time during your, your training. The ordination charge that I'm about to give you is spoken on behalf of the gathered presbyters and the congregation here this evening, many, many members of which have known you well, having followed your path to this very significant moment in your life with their interest, their prayers, their hopes, and their affection. First, I call upon you in dependence upon the grace of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit to serve the Lord with gladness. Before coming here, I reread the charge that many years ago was addressed to me at my ordination. It is that famous exhortation contained in the ancient ordinal of the Book of Common Prayer and is a fine example of the standards of the 16th century Reformation. Perhaps with family and many friends present, I was too occupied to listen properly to the long admonitions and solemn words. Had I done so, I might well have done a run-up, <laughs> as the heavy responsibilities of pastoral ministry were relentlessly set before me. Certainly the office of a minister, steward, and watchman in the Church of God is a weighty one, and there will be many and numerous difficulties to be met with in the course of your service, but while it is a serious call, it is also a very happy one. It could be that in the old prayer book charge, the note of joy was not sufficiently marked. For have you not been summoned by God and his people to glorious work? Is not the Lord Jesus a wonderful Savior, friend, and Lord? Can you conceive of a greater privilege than to preach to the people the unsearchable riches of Christ? So, my brother, whatever the pressures and perplexities that must lie ahead for any shepherd of Christ's flock in a hostile world, remember Paul. Imprisoned in Rome, strangely surrounded by envy and rivalry in that infant church, and writing to comfort his Philippian friends in their most painful struggles, his message, as you will well recall, is to rejoice in the Lord, and again he says, rejoice. And what of Christ? As he speaks to his anxious disciples about his own soon departure, he has this to say, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Serve the Lord with gladness. Next, I call upon you to serve the Lord with integrity. This again was emphasized by Paul as we discover in those initial words of his great farewell to the Ephesian elders. You know, he writes, how I lived, notice that, how I lived, before he even talks about his preaching. You notice, he writes, how I lived the whole time I was with you. I served the Lord with great humility and tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. It is very easy to miss the point here. Paul is not bragging or asking for their admiration and applause. He's meeting head-on the smears and vile misrepresentations leveled against him by his enemies within as well as without the church. They have accused him of arrogance, of being a control freak, of seeking personal gain, and of failing to preach the Christian gospel in all its fullness. In reply, Paul says to the Ephesians, you know. Three times he says, you know, you know, you know my way of life and my work among you. My brother, the visible church has never been without cheats and charlatans, 
among its leaders and ministers. They cause great mischief amongst God's people. You will have nothing to do with their appeal or methods, however alluring or apparently successful they may seem to be. For Christ's servants have renounced once and for all secret and shameful ways. I call you then to pastoral integrity. Finally, I charge you to serve the Lord with boldness. We who are older can recall the blessing of personal freedom in society, which freedom is now under real threat. But the apostles must have faced far more threatening times, yet how courageous they were. So you are not to be afraid. In recent days, we witnessed the 70th anniversary of D-Day and heard the fine tributes paid to the heroes from Britain, America, and other countries who dared to storm through those open beaches among the hail of bullets. I think my particular hero is the late Lord Lovett with his trusty piper, though I hate the noise, leading his commands into battle. Yet is it not the case that we Christians are in a greater battle and a more demanding warfare still? Bunyan's Mr. Steadfast and Mr. Valiant for Truth are going to be greatly needed in our time. If the gospel is to be proclaimed fearlessly, as it should be. You therefore, my friend, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the prayers of God's people will support you. So may joy, integrity, and courage mark your life and ministry, now and in the future, for Jesus' sake, and for the good of his people. Amen and amen. One of the unmissable things in an occasion like this is the wideness of the fellowship that we have with the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ all throughout the world. Those present with us this evening and the greetings that we've received reminds us of that joy in the communion of saints, but not only horizontally, as it were, across the world today, but our standing as one with the Church of Jesus Christ throughout all the ages, for we're part of that great story that will not end until the coming of our Lord Himself in glory. And we are part of that great company of saints who will meet Him with joy on that day. So as we end this evening, we're going to sing together the hymn on the screens that reminds us of these things. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah. O may thy soldiers faithful, true, and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of old, and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Hallelujah.
Let's pray. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God, our Father, be glory forever and ever. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>